Okay, so I just got my meat grinder in the mail. I'm super excited to try it. On half the screen in this video, it's gonna be a longer one, but you're gonna be seeing me try to put it together for the first time. It's electric, not manual, um, so it should be pretty easy once I figure out how to put it together. And then I'm gonna be trying to grind my own pork today from a big giant pork shoulder or pork butt that I have in the fridge. I'm gonna be putting some in the crock pot and I wanna get into making sausage. So I just thought I would you know, do a first batch today and see how it goes. It's supposed to be pretty easy. So that's gonna be my portion of the video. And the other side of the screen, you're gonna be hearing from Peter Ballerstead. He's a PhD in agronomy and he has a minor in ruminant nutrition. He's going to be busting some of the narratives that we hear a lot about sustainability, about what's uh, dietary, dietary information about what's good for humans, but also what's good for the planet. What is sustainable agriculture? What effect does ruminant agriculture actually have on the planet and CO2 and all these kinds of things? And I think you're going to be surprised if you've never heard, you know, this perspective before from someone who is very, very knowledgeable in these systems and how they work. Now, I will say this is a little bit more of a high level uh, talk. I think he only had about 30 minutes to present his slides. And so there's definitely a lot more detail that can be gone into. And I've listened to several other interviews with him that are all fantastic that go into more depth and detail on these topics. So if this piques your interest, click on one of the links below and you can listen to more details, more in-depth conversations about the stuff that he's talking about in this video. So I think it's important to leave this one in its full context because everything really just adds, you know, adds up by the end of the video and, and in lieu of chopping them up into short chunks, which lose a lot of context, I'm gonna try to keep this one together. So for anyone who wants to know exactly what you're getting yourself into, I made a list of topics that uh, are going to be covered in his talk today. Feeding the population by 2050. How are we going to feed all the people on the planet? We hear all about plant-based solutions, but he's going to offer his opinion. He's going to go into the roots of our dietary guidelines. There's a difference between ingestion, what we ingest, and our digestion, what we actually use, what we assimilate, what our bodies do with that. The fact that ruminants agriculture all around the world is a significant source of wealth building and wealth accumulation and that's uh, something that doesn't really get brought up when we talk about um, a lot of these issues in the general narratives that we hear. He's going to talk about biohydrogenation, what that is and why it matters. The fact that plant and animal proteins are not equivalent. The fact that we're not having an honest conversation and a well-rounded conversation when it comes to the ideas about sustainability, the health of the planet, the health and flourishing of humankind. Pesticides in plants. Here's an interesting statistic. 99.99% of pesticides that we ingest are naturally in plants. They are defense chemicals that are produced by plants to defend themselves. So if you're concerned about pesticides and you're thinking that you're doing more for your health by eating organically labeled produce, you might want to think again. He talks about that. He's going to discuss the difference between monogastric animals, which we are one of them, and ruminant digestive systems, why they're different, why that matters dietarily for us versus what cows can eat and other ruminant animals can eat, and what and how that affects the nutrition of X, Y, and Z going on. It's inaccurate to call cows vegetarians. He's gonna explain why and explain what they actually are. And finally, throughout the whole talk, you're gonna hear this idea that our diet is already plant-based and that needs to change, according to Peter Ballerstead, PhD. So let's get into the entire talk and thanks for watching today. Let's just get right into it. How many people here are involved in agriculture? Show of hands. Okay, you that didn't raise your hands, you are involved in agriculture. The fact that we have the agricultural system that we do allows us to come to things like this rather than working in the field and trying to put up the harvest for the coming winter and the spring following, right? We're not dependent on so much uh, going right for us to avoid starvation. So maybe just a little mind shift is in order and I hope I can accomplish or at least initiate that process while I'm here. Um, uh, because the reality is that in America today, the average adult American is more likely to have direct personal experience with the criminal justice system than with production agriculture. 
And there's so very much wrong with that, and there's so much we could talk about. But the point is, it's a remarkably small number of people that are supporting everything else. And as an agriculturalist coming into this community, I would ask us to kind of maybe reconsider a little bit, because part of my role act between my tribes. You know, here's my nutrition tribe, you, my brothers and sisters. I work in agriculture, they're my brothers. I'm trying to get us together, okay? And there's some things that are gonna be in the way of that, and I think that's to our detriment. Um, so I'm just gonna offer some contradictory observations and people can do what they want as we go along. Um, but one, for example, is there are two theories about why agriculture developed that I find kind of compelling. One is, as a natural outcome of our nature as trading primates. <laughs> How can I get something from this environment that I can trade with Og over there for something from Ogs? Okay, the other thing that's interesting is that it was only about 8,000 years ago as we exit that CO2 levels rose following the increase in temperature to a point that allowed sufficient plant growth to support agriculture. It's an interesting theory, and again, it's a little different than many of the narratives that we hear. So again, um, my formal training is in agronomy and ruminant nutrition, so I am trained in those sciences to do with healthy soils and healthy plants and healthy animals. And like many, I've had my own personal experience that's led me to do a good bit of study on healthy humans, <laughs> or more precisely, how to improve my own health. And I find myself in a position where now all these things are very well related and I can communicate to my agricultural tribe about the health message and then I hope I can communicate to this tribe the agricultural message. Um, and I'm an advocate for ruminants. Uh, modern humans exist because there were ruminants. We didn't evolve to eat meat, we evolved because we ate meat. Um, so I am promoting an organization that I call the Ruminati, and I'm recruiting new members all the time. People that want to learn more about ruminant animals and their contribution, uh, as well as be able to effectively communicate the message about the role of animal products in the human diet, specifically ruminant animal products. Uh, and the fact is that we can't feed today's world without ruminant animal agriculture let alone the world that we're gonna have in 33 years. We must improve the efficiency and the productivity of ruminant animal agriculture worldwide. And again, this conflicts with many narratives and I'll try to get some information to you today to maybe justify that position. So another thing that I'm arguing for is that we need a re ruminant revolution just as we had a green revolution. We need to make that investment in private, and we certainly need to get policy shifted to emphasize ruminant animal agriculture again to achieve the goal of feeding the world of 2050. It's hard for people functioning in the, you know, functioning sciences, <laughs> sorry, um, to realize just what a load of male bovine fecal matter has been the realm of human nutrition. Okay, this, these are two quotes that I like to put up to just kind of bookend things. 1963, every woman knows that carbohydrates are fattening. This is a piece of common knowledge which few nutritionists would dispute. And then by 1994, obesity has become a carbohydrate deficiency syndrome. Isn't that remarkable? And was there science that justified that shift in outlook? And I would say not. And again, this audience probably is well aware of that. And so perhaps we shouldn't be surprised at the observational data of this decrease, this decline in human health since then. There are other reasons that we could postulate, but let's just say that's, this is where we are. 
Again, as we're thinking about priorities and policy and investment and things, uh, maybe it's time for us to look for other places to put money when we talk about health than just in the disease care industry. Um, and so a personal uh, confession here, I agree with Dean Ornish. Yeah, I may be the only person to do that here. Um, I agree that what's good for you is good for the planet. Uh, I suspect that we're going to differ on the details, however, because <laughs> I believe that butter, meat, and cheese, the products of ruminant animal agriculture, are good for us, and I believe that ruminant animal agriculture is the only truly sustainable source that we've got going for us. So I have a personal dream, my dream of the day, when the public understands that their consumption of the products in the background lessens their need for the products in the foreground, and I do believe that day is approaching. Frankly, it can't get much worse. <laughs> um, but again, my concern is that we may have some conventional wisdom within our various tribes that prevents us from effectively communicating between those communities that could then affect the kind of change. If we're going to have a conversation about sustainability, and too often it's what I call sustainababble, um, it's a marketing label, it's, it's not a real conversation about sustainability. We're only considering one factor when in fact we have to consider multiple factors like societal factors, like economic factors, like uh, ecological factors. All of those have to be considered because there's costs and benefits to every decision that we get to make. Okay, so what's the, what's the burden of chronic disease on individual human beings, on their families? on their communities. It's massive. Is that considered in the conventional understanding of sustainability? Uh, it, it, if it is, it's from this plant-based narrative, not what I would suggest is a more informed one. Uh, what is the cost of chronic disease? Well, we know overt diabetes care is approaching a billion dollars a day. That's diabetes and prediabetes. That's not considering the other metabolic syndromes. Uh, and ecological, is it even possible to farm without livestock? Is that in fact possible? And if you recognize the name of Sir Albert Howard, you might understand him and his role in organic agriculture, and we'll come back to that subject in a little bit. The great enemy of truth is very often by deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. Too often, we hold fast to the cliches of our forebears. We, uh, we subject to a prefabricated set of interpretations. We enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. And yes, I think that happens within this tribe as well. It's been said before, but it's not widely recognized, the roots of our dietary guidelines. And these roots do extend back a long, long way but we should at least acknowledge that the 60s and 70s environmental movement was a factor. We should acknowledge that the 19th century um, faith-based vegetarian movement played a factor and still plays a factor today. And if all we look at is some policy document without considering these others, we probably won't make very much progress. So before I go any further, I want to make it really clear that I respect Gary Taub's, his books have been very impactful in my personal life. I'm going to use this paragraph from why we get fat and what to do about it to make a specific point. Okay, bear with me. Carbohydrate restricted diets typically, if not perhaps ideally, replace the carbohydrates in the diet with large or at least larger portions of animal products beginning with eggs for breakfast, moving to meat, fish, or fowl for lunch and dinner. The implications of that are proper to debate. Isn't our dependence on animal products already bad for the environment? Well, first problem, uh, humanity's diet today is plant-based. And no. <laughs> and won't it just get worse? No. Isn't livestock production a major contrib contributor to global warming? No. Water shortages? No. And pollution? No. When thinking about a healthy diet, shouldn't we think about what's good for the planet as well as what's good for us? Well, it does matter, <laughs> doesn't it? If we do in fact know what's good for the planet, 
do we have the right to kill animals for our food or put them to work for us in producing it? Well, we're heterotrophs. And already I'm using terms, I'll define them quickly, but stay with me if you don't know what that one means. Isn't the only morally and ethically defensible lifestyle a vegetarian one or even a vegan one? I really don't want to get into this, um, but I would just point out that if in fact I'm right in all these assertions, then any claim to morality based on so many flaws <laughs> is tenuous. And people are welcome to their personal decisions, obviously, but I don't think they should be the basis for public policy, the especially one that has such far-reaching consequences. So there is this reality of being a heterotroph. Human beings uh, cannot produce organic compounds from inorganic sources, we have to eat other organisms to get proteins and energy. It's just the way we are. Deal with it. But we've got these friends called ruminants. And ruminant animals perform absolutely essential ecological functions. And this is my list. And I'll go through it quickly. Convert structural and non-structural carbohydrate into fat. It converts plant protein and non-protein nitrogen into high-quality animal protein. It reduces the polyunstable uh, fatty acids to monounstable and stable fat saturated fatty acids through a process called biohydrogenation. It produces B vitamin B12 and other vitamins, increases bioavailability of essential minerals, degrades anti-quality plant components like phytates uh, and phytonutrients, um, maintains health of grassland ecosystems, which in fact are the largest biome on terrestrial earth, recycle nutrients, build soil health, provide services, muscle power like draft, byproducts like leather, uh, just to name a few, generates new wealth. Significant source of new wealth generation around the world is ruminant animal agriculture. Ruminant animals are those animals that have the specialized digestive anatomy that allows for fermentation, pre-gastric, before our stomachs, essentially, you've got this massive structure, three separate bodies, uh, two, sorry, uh, but one is really uh, two regions. What this permits is the di digestion of cellulose. Cellulose is the most abundant carbohydrate in the biosphere. No vertebrate animal makes cellulase, the enzyme necessary to break the bonds between glucose units. If it were not for the microorganisms that live in the rumen, or those that live out in the environment, and photosynthesis continued unabated, in about 25 years, life on Earth would stagnate due to a lack of CO2. Now, it's interesting, this, this match evolutionarily between human beings and ruminants. Humans have essential amino acids in their diet. Ruminants do not. Humans have essential fatty acids in their diet, and apparently ruminants do not. Humans do not have essential carbohydrates in their diet. Ruminants have two forms that are essential. They have to have structural carbohydrates, fiber, and they have to have non-structural carbohydrates, sugars and starches. And this is just a rep simplified representation of, again, monogastric animals like us, where we have the um, macronutrients, carbohydrate, protein, fat coming in, being subjected to stomach acid and enzymes, and then we have sugars, amino acids, and fatty acids being absorbed from the small intestine. With ruminants, it's a little bit different. We have, again, this pre-gastric fermentation process. Their diet is primarily carbohydrate and proteins. And you could put quotes around protein because a significant amount of that is non-protein nitrogen. From the microbial activity within their rumen, they produce methane, volatile fatty acids, and ammonia. Then once that material is sufficiently broken down, it can flow into the lower part of the, the abomasum and then into the omasum, and the omasum is essentially like our stomach. By the time we get that ingesta flowing down into the small intestine, there's almost no sugar left to be absorbed. It's all been fermented. And virtually all of the protein, the amino acids that are being absorbed were microbial protein in origin. So the, rumin the ruminant animal is 
sheltering, raising these microbial populations, and then harvesting the byproducts of their activity as well as they themselves. So one of my campaigns is to raise awareness that in fact red meat is a fermented plant product. And, and given all the buzz about fermented products, I think we might be able to make some traction here. There's a difference between ingestion and digestion. We are not what we eat, we are what our bodies do with what we eat. And so the fat content of a ruminant's diet is less than 6% fat. By the time our microbe population within the rumen get done, 70 to 80% of that animal's caloric needs ends up coming from the short chain volatile fatty acids that are produced. So a low, fiber di a low fat diet goes in, the animal harvests, digests a high fat diet. And then there's this interesting thing that I mentioned briefly before, biohydrogenation. About 80% of the polyunsaturated fatty acids that are in the diet of a ruminant end up being unsaturated to some degree. And so as a result of this, the flesh of ruminant animals is going to be far less influenced by diet than any other animal. And this is another evolutionary neat trick. And this is the practical outcome of that. Let me explain this just a little bit. Uh, what we're showing is, in blue, the omega-3 content. In red, the omega-6 content. These first two pairs are from a feeding study that were, that were done by Dr. Duck at Clemson University. So this is a feeding trial looking at these two, and you see the difference there. And then they went shopping and they bought some chicken breast skinless pork chop ribeye steak, and then they bought some chicken thigh, and then my friend Adele Height plugged in some soybean oil, and then another friend plugged in the components that are within the box. The point here is that beef or any other ruminant flesh is not a particularly rich source of either omega-6 or omega-3, regardless of how it's produced. If you're interested in getting more omega-3, eat fish. If you're interested in getting less omega-6, then by all means, please stop eating tofu or walnuts or soybean oil, and then you could start looking at some other products as well. Okay. That may be a little different than some of our narratives, but that's the data. So I mentioned before that ruminant animals, there's very little sugar that remains to be absorbed from the intestinal system. And so these animals are entirely dependent on gluconeogenic pathways for the glucose that they need. Find that interesting. Ruminants rule. I'm not sure how important it is, but apparently ruminant muscle contains much less glycogen than does the flesh of other species. So the point would be that it would be inaccurate to call a ruminant a vegetarian. It would be, if anything, more correct to call them microbivores or microbians. They're raising these teeming hosts of animals, pro uh, bacteria, protozoa, fungi, and they're harvesting them. They're harnessing them to produce byproducts, which they absorb, and then they eat the animals themselves. And in fact, ruminant animals increase the human edible food supply, regardless of what you've heard. At least half, and perhaps as much as 100% of the diet of ruminants worldwide on a life cycle basis is, is feedstuffs that humans can't utilize directly. And in fact, in California, we can produce more human food energy and protein of a higher quality per acre by growing alfalfa, feeding it to a dairy cow, than we can by growing wheat and eating it. Again, a little different than the narrative. I said before that the human diet is already plant-based. And if the researchers and clinicians that I respect are right, that's got to change. <laughs> that itself has consequences. Uh, but you can see developing world developed worldwide on average. 
And then if we look at protein, in the developed world and in the world as a whole, our brothers and sisters are subsisting on a diet where the majority of their protein is already coming from plants. I can think of no logical reason why we should follow that model. But that's the rhetoric and the narrative. Malnourishment looks a little different today than it did um, a few decades ago. Today, we've got about 800,000 human beings, our brothers and sisters worldwide, that are suffering from chronic undernourishment, famine. We've got 2.2 billion that are overweight or obese. I would suggest that this is just another form of malnutrition. So we've got 3 billion brothers and sisters that are malnourished. What are we going to do about that? And oh, by the way, we've got 2 billion more coming in the next 33 years. 2050, the UN is projecting a world population in excess of 9 billion people. UN is calling for a 100% increase in food production, and is also FAO is predicting a 66% increase in the demand for animal protein by 2050. And they're saying that that has to come from virtually the same land areas today. The problem with that, of course, is we're losing farmland at a rapid rate for a number of reasons, which we could talk about. On a global, uh, sorry, where intakes of animal products are low, increases in meat in particular, milk and eggs in the diets of toddlers and school children have resulted in marked improvements in growth, cognitive development, and health. What we as any kind of concerned and logical human beings, I think, ought to be about is what can we do to f increase the flourishing of our brothers and sisters around the world. 40, but in America, 40% of Americans aren't getting enough protein, and there's problems with these, but this is data from uh, US uh, Dietary Guidelines and NHANES data. And most females over the age of eight aren't getting enough protein, okay? Now, the two problems that I see with this right away are, what is their target? We could argue about that, right? What is their intake target? It might well be too low. Number two is they're considering plant protein and animal protein to be equivalent and they are not. So the number's undoubtedly worse. Again, uh, nutritional value of animal protein is superior to that from plants. But that's really inconvenient if your narrative is we need to be on a plant-based diet, right? We have to find a way to ignore that. Uh, on a global basis, oh my goodness, um, Animals produce about a pound or a kilogram of human food protein for every 1.4. This is all animal agriculture, and this is worldwide. But the exchange is that every pound of animal protein is worth 1.4 pounds of plant protein. <laughs> so it's a wash at the end. The quote is, thus diverting grains from animal production to direct human consumption would in the long run result in little increase in total food protein and would decrease average dietary quality and diversity, and I would add, degrade the environment. So ruminants rule. Remember, that last slide was all animal agriculture. Ruminants are far more efficient. They actually increase the human utilizable protein supply. You get more than a pound out for every pound you feed in. Again, the wonder of a ruminant animal. Today, the meat supply worldwide, about a quarter of the meat is coming from ruminants. I would suggest that's the component that we need to increase for a number of reasons. And it isn't that hard if you look at, we have less than 10% of the world's beef cattle in the United States and we're producing about 20% of the beef. If we could leverage that technology appropriately around the world, we could produce more beef from fewer animals, which would lower environmental impact. Here's what we got to play with. The Earth's surface, uh, two-thirds of that is ocean. Only 4% of the Earth's total surface is cultivatable. That's where people are telling us we're going to grow our plant-based diet on. And that's the land we're losing rapidly. Meanwhile, we've got 14% of the world being rangeland, land that can produce grass, cellulose, that we can then run ruminant animals on to produce high quality animal protein and animal fat. We've got an additional 10% that's forest, and we can run animals in forest. We can have silvopastoral systems. 
And so we could increase the resource available for us to produce the food that we need. These are the crops that are currently being grown on that 4% of the Earth's surface, and already more than three quarters are going to human consumption and use. So where's the rest of this going to come from that we're supposed to get by not feeding it to animals? And in fact, if you look at just the cereal crops, already two-thirds of that is going to humans directly. Again, our diet is already plant-based, and that needs to change. Greenhouse gas emissions, you'll hear all kinds of numbers thrown around. Here's one set that shows that agriculture worldwide is the third you know, segment, um, but there's a couple things that you could say about that. One is if the societies were more prosperous, you'd see uh, f you know, industry get bigger, for example. Also, if we look at what's going on in the United States, you see a very different number where the total from agriculture is 9%. All of animal agriculture was listed at 7%. This is per EPA. I've actually seen a little more recent data that says the beef industry is responsible for under 4%. Again, this is a little different than the propaganda that we hear. And we should remember that our cattle are not alchemists. They're not creating carbon or nitrogen. They're cycling it out of the food that they ingested. The food got it from the atmosphere and from the soil. It's a cycling of these nutrients. Okay, um, but here's one, th this is an actual study, this is not model projections. This is an actual study where we're measuring the increase in soil carbon in crop ground that's been converted into dairy pasture, irrigated dairy pasture in Georgia. And what they're seeing is a third of a percent increase per year in soil carbon, that's organic matter. Every 1% more organic matter in soil means that you can hold an additional acre inch of water, that's 27,000 gallons per acre. Okay, so there's about 22 million acres of degraded row crop ground. This is the ground that we abused with pre-modern agriculture. Okay, and now we're, we're, what, what are we going to do with it? Okay, 22 million, we take 10% 10 10 of that. What kind of impact could we make? Thank you. Um, so that would be this kind of a sequestering of carbon equivalent. Well, I got trouble with those numbers, so let me give you some equivalents. Three and a half billion car equivalents, well, we've only got one billion worldwide. 38.4 billion barrels of oil, the U.S. used 7.2. 4,300 coal-fired power plants, we've got less than 430 in the United States. What this is telling me is this is not an honest conversation about the contribution of livestock to anthropogenic global or greenhouse gas emissions. They're not considering where, you know, the input side. They're only considering the emission side, okay? So I don't think we've been having an honest conversation. Now that's before we get even deeper into any of the weeds around that subject, which I'm happy to do. But I think that we would be better served to be focusing on the water cycle instead of the carbon cycle. Unfortunately, the carbon cycle is what's giving us a lot of funding these days. Right, and so we chase the money and whatever. So here's just a very interesting test showing water-stable soil structure. This was a, these are two same soil types. This one is under long-term grassland. This one is under continuous conventional corn production. Okay, and 25 minutes later, the one from the cornfield is broken down completely while the other one remains virtually intact. That means that soil will be more productive. That soil will accept more water and hold it without runoff. And here's a demonstration of runoff difference where you have four different surface types and the pasture is having all of the water coming from this rainfall simulator into, not off of. And so in the time it took to collect this gallon of sediment laden water, there's none from the pasture. This means less erosion, less surface water pollution, less resource degradation. Nothing is better for soil health than long-term grass cover. Okay, sorry. Um, again, narratives. Um, when you start to see things like this, whatever organic agriculture was at one point, let us at least accept that it is no longer that. Okay, and here this idea, you know, you can eat as healthy as you want, but if it's not organic, it's unhealthy. 
Well, we're dealing with faith system. There's no objective evidence to support that. Remember, it's a pay-to-play label claim, not proof of superior health, safety, nutrition, or environmental impact. Really, organic Gatorade? The risks that kill people and the risks that concern people are completely different. Okay, If you're starving, you have one problem. <laughs> and apparently, if we're, we're, if we're well-fed, we've got many. Okay, or, And notice the cigarettes themselves are not organic. It's just the tobacco that they use to make the cigarettes is organic. But we can go further. We can look at organic and, you know, mac and cheese made with cheese from grass-fed cows. Or we can look at organic Pop-Tarts. Or we can look at gummy bears. Or we can get really bizarre. I can't believe they're serious. If your reason for going organic is to lower your exposure to pesticides, please consider this quote, 99.99% by weight of the pesticides in the American diet are chemicals that plants produce to defend themselves. Only 52 natural pesticides have been tested in high-dose animal cancer tests, and about half, 27 in fact, are rodent carcinogens. But because they're natural, we don't test them. So if you want to truly lower your burden of pesticide exposure in a meaningful way, feed these to a ruminant, eat the ruminant. So you can tell when idols are being worshipped because human beings are being sacrificed. And I think we all need to take a look at some of these narratives that we're carrying along unexamined with us. Okay. Uh, again, I think what we ought to be about is, is maximizing human flourishing worldwide. I think that's truly uh, a worthwhile effort. And we also need to ask ourselves, as Daryl said, how are we going to expand this beyond our little bubble? So if an honest man is wrong after demonstrating that he's wrong, he either stops being wrong or he stops being honest. I've just dropped a bunch of little facts on you. I share my sources. I'm open to the fact that as an agriculturalist, I'm coming with my perspective. And I hope I'm living by this myself. Okay, so I want to have the conversation. But I also want us all to kind of take a, a look at what we're, what we're doing and what we're saying. Um, and, and I'm happy to help. Again, um, I'm all about advocating for ruminant animal agriculture and I'm uh, advocating for animal products in the human diet. Uh, this is how you can contact me. Just Google the name, you'll find me. I'm sorry for going long. Thank you for your patience. Thanks for sticking it out.